so thank you very much for uh, this opportunity. Uh, so I'm presenting the work of my PhD student, Manisha, who going to be here. Uh, so this is actually a hobby project, to be very honest, and I'm going to present the excitement as an end user of the, uh, of the tools that are developed rather than as a tool developer. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit of cognitive neuroscience uh, as well as uh, uh, our excitement from a, a data science perspective. So uh, this is all about uh, meta-analysis in uh, brain imaging. Uh, and uh, the whole idea here is that uh, there is so much of data that it's very difficult to uh, make sense out of it. Uh, there are tens of thousands of studies coming out every year. And uh, you know everybody claims everything, right? So uh, chordate is involved in language. Uh, motor cortex may be involved in something else. So, uh, everybody, uh, the uh, ultimate idea of what do you do with all this data is, is functional imaging helping us a little bit more. Okay. Uh, all right, yeah, that's better. So um, we have had discussions about uh, the traditional uh, software-based uh, approaches. Um, where uh, people use a, a statistical parametric mapping or an equivalent for analyzing brain images data. Or uh, more recently, from the last five, 10 years, uh, people have been also using machine learning methods for reverse inferencing. So what people are able to do is rather than um, finding a activation in the brain side given a cognitive state, you are now trying to decode the brain state based on the activations. Now, uh, I would like to bring together these two points here and try to address the issue of variability uh, across participants, across experiments, um, and across different scanners or different softwares. Now, I'm going to actually use this uh, different experiments as a case study on uh, decision making, my area of research. And I give you a couple of examples how I have used meta-analysis uh, for the benefit of how do we address different paradigms, different uh, people, different software issue. So meta-analysis, uh, again, uh, as an end user, uh, we are trying to find consistency, consistency of activation uh, across multiple studies, and specificity. Now, this kind of a claim is only going to try, uh, try to uh, uh, be expanded only when we are uh, able to use machine learning approaches. Why I mean that is when I have a coordinate based reporting of uh, brain activations, I can definitely find consistency by pooling across studies, right? And there are very good developed algorithms, very well uh, vetted uh, maths behind it. And if we have access to the data, and, uh, the more joy we can actually analyze uh, uh, the data uh, directly. Now, when I talk about specificity, I'm also trying to see uh, the functional imaging in the light of um, uh, the neophrenology. Are we really talking about cognitive segregations? How much of integration is there? And if given a, a brain activity pattern, what is the most likely cognitive state the person is going to be? For this purpose, if I can uh, apply this Bayesian framework, and uh, uh, Yarkoni and colleagues uh, have done this uh, remarkable uh, 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 software called Neurosynth, um, where they are trying to apply a Bayesian inference. And in, if we want to apply Bayesian inference, you need to have n number of alternative hypotheses. Then you get the probability of one hypothesis being higher or lower, right? So what they have done, uh, really, uh, I would say, a kind of a big data approach, and I was very excited right from its early development. Uh, of course, I've been uh, following the activation likelihood estimation of uh, meta-analysis. Now, uh, the, the new approach that they have done is a, a, a large-scale text mining. Uh, they initially started with uh, full text, and uh, I'm going to really talk about how we were uh, you know, trying to tweak it at that stage. Uh, and uh, in the full text, what they have done is uh, through text mining, 
taken up high frequency words, at least one in every thousand, and then they have done automatic coordinate extraction of the brain uh, peak activation data, and then try to come up with this uh, uh, very nice web interface, in fact, uh, of uh, uh, analyzing uh, the number of terms that they have in their database. Now, this was a limitation from our perspective. So, uh, for example, uh, I wanted to analyze reward-based uh, studies, and Neurosynth di did have that as a term. Uh, so, what I have done is I have taken the brain map database. Brain map database is a very uh, well uh, documented, hand curated, very well uh, uh, worked out by researchers themselves and entered into a database very carefully done. The, uh, so, they have these reward-based studies. So, I have taken the uh, brain map database, use the ginger ale tool, get uh, automated likelihood estimation. So I have the consistent activation from uh, the brain map database. Then um, Torweger has this MKDA tool, uh, multi uh, density analysis. So at a point of time when ALE uh, was not very well developed, uh, so uh, MKDA was supposed to be a better method. Now there is a workaround for uh, the limitations of ALE, where you have more, you know, reporting bias is basically accounted for well in MKDA. But uh, both are different methods uh, of uh, analysis pipelines. But what I was trying to see is, do I, given the same data set, do I get the same activation patterns or not? So more or less with a different intensity, I do get uh, uh, through different software, through different pipelines, the reward studies the meta-analysis gives me the brain areas which I know of, right? So it gives me the midbrain, striatum, uh, medial prefrontal cortex, and so on. Now what I do, I go to this Neurosynth software, do a few clicks, um, try to see. So this is a different subset of studies, right? And this is majorly based on text mining. So there are inaccuracies. The original paper, uh, um, by Yarkoni uh, has done all the required validations. So I'm not going to worry about that part, about the validity of using it. But what I'm trying to do here is trying to see what the forward inferencing and what the reverse inferencing really mean. So forward inferencing would give me um, the consistency of activations, whereas the reverse inference could possibly point out to specificity of activations, right? And I do see differences here, all right? This is expected. I might actually expect that the specificity brain areas will be lesser than what uh, the consistent activations that are being reported. But surprise, now I have a side-by-side -side comparison of the two things that uh, you have seen just now. Um, so the left graph uh, is for ALE and MKDA. Uh, so not all, so what I've done is for every brain area that I can get from an uh, automatic labeling uh, software, I have calculated, given the total volume of this brain area, how much percentage is active and what was common by a binary conjunction, all right? So I do find, you know, uh, areas that only MKDA reported or only ALE reported and also a large overlap, all right? So this may be just because of a different software. But uh, in the forward and reverse inference, this is where I started getting more inquisitive about it, is, uh, as I said, the reverse inference is probably has to be a subset, right? But I do also find uh, some areas which are popping up in reverse inference, but didn't pop up when I was doing the forward inferencing. What it means is these areas are probably not reported that often, all right? So like the superior orbital or some part of the middle orbital, the gyrus rectus, olfactory, some parts is not very commonly reported. Okay, fine, a case study uh, for its validity and comparison is good. So what I'm going to do is I'm really trying to use the power of neuroinformatics and try to see this wonderful area of de uh, decision making. Why I say uh, neuroinformatics can solve my problem is these are different worlds. We are all talking about decision making, 
The paradigms used in perceptual, value-based, and social decision-making are vastly different. You cannot do them in a single study. It's not possible, all right? We are all talking about common neural currency. We talk about, you know, reward processing by midbrain neurons. We are talking about ventral striatum involved in decision-making. We are talking about a common neural currency in the brain. Where is it? The paradigms are different. We consistently report the same areas. So does that mean that there is a common neural currency? How do you actually bridge together? In fact, uh, what we did, uh, did that time is, because I couldn't get all these from the Neurosynth database, and I wanted to exploit the automatic coordinate extraction from this database, so what I've done is I have, at that point of a time, created my own uh, custom-made mini Neurosynth in my lab. So all I needed to do was download the abstracts from PubMed, take the abstracts instead of the full text, so now, re more recently, Neurosynth entire thing is uh, now migrated to abstracts only because that's the more relevant terms rather than full text. I'll give you some examples later on. And then the analysis I have done in um, Ginger Ailey, which is the tool that the brain map provides. So I'm just trying to bring, uh, make this into an automated uh, analysis pipeline kind of a thing. Just as an illustration, okay, so if I pick up these words from abstracts, I get, uh, you know, uh, 84 studies which have the term value. I don't know what it means, but that word exists there. Or 61 uh, papers have social and 36 papers have perceptual. I had used my filtering criteria to have one of these terms, reward, decision, choice, value, social, or percept. Just an expansion, okay? This is the final data I'm actually presenting. So there were 8,061 studies in the database when I started with. There were uh, about 2,500 studies which had at least one of these terms. If I included reward as an additional term, it's just uh, 200 more studies. Of these, I filtered out and got 639 studies. Now just look at this small Venn diagram. There was just one study which had all the three terms, perceptual value and social. And when I looked at the title of that paper, it didn't make any sense to be a decision-making study. But nevertheless, as a data processing person, I, I decided, let me fix my filtering criteria and proceed with this. Now, what do I find? I do a ALE meta-analysis separately, three different analysis, right? And I find uh, more or less, again, a consistent thing, but a different pattern of activation. So striatum, orbitofrontal cortex, you know, the same areas we've been repeatedly talking about or probably repeatedly uh, having uh, uh, published. So those are areas pop up. Now, after that, what I do is I start to, you know, compare them pairwise. I do conjunction analysis. I do contrast analysis. And then uh, try to see what is it that these meta-analysis results will give me. So common neural activations across all the three domains, not a big surprise, a little bit of motor areas uh, and the common uh, reward and decision-making areas, fine. So caudate vitamin, pallidum and insula, I've just plotted it. So these are the three colors. So you can see where the conjunction of all of them is. So there are also some areas which are uh, not common, right? So let me just look at this uh, independent analysis, okay? So perceptual and social decision making was found to activate anterior cingulate, which was not there in all the three, okay? In all the three, I have not claimed anterior cingulate, right? So that's one area. Value and perceptual decision making, I had left inferior parietal area. And for social and value-based decision-making, uh, uh, they were angular gyrus, caudate, anterior cingulate, medial or frontal. So what's happening is, it's not as if the common neural currency is saying that there are no specific brain areas also. So a little bit more uh, beyond that, this is just a side-by-side -side comparison of uh, what is the level of activation, right? So 20 percentage when it comes to all three domains, but when I take only the value and social based decision making is slightly more for the caudate. So this percentage is percentage of the original anatomical brain area, all right? So I'm not com comparing them yet. This is a qualitative analysis here, just to see how much overlap I see. Now the domain specific activations. This is also a simple math, okay? 
I'm really doing it like a binary a Venn diagram sort of a thing. So, so uh, some part of the amygdala was more active in social situations a lot. And several other regions uh, uh, were for value based alone. Probably monetary decision making is more dominant paradigm. So uh, we have lot many more uh, brain areas coming there. And parietal precentral gyrus, supplementary motor area, these were more often reported in perceptual decision making tasks. So that probably says that there is some task specific activity as well, right? So now coming to the comparisons, right? Now these are really contrasts, the statistical comparisons. So again, there is greater activity in um, frontal areas for perceptual versus value, uh, and uh, in uh, anterior cingulate and medial prefrontal for social versus perceptual. So two at a time, I'm I'm just showing the comparisons. For perceptual versus value based, value based really activated a lot of these uh, medial OFC, caudate, anti cingulate, right? And uh, the perceptual was more of inferior frontal, inferior parietal, those areas, right? And social versus value, as I said, only amygdala was the more in social, uh, but value uh, based decision making has a lot more. So right insula is also more in the social decision making, all right? So that's in the blue. I've, I haven't rep, uh, rep, uh, repeated the uh, legends. So what it means is, uh, if I have to use this, you know, data-based approaches for our neuroinformatics approaches for such classical me meta-analysis, I might have to uh, supplement it with lot many more, uh, you know, evidences. So I need to say what happens when you have reward very specifically involved or not? What happens in uh, a choice compared to decision making studies? What about those studies? You know, there were like 393 studies which were not necessarily involving either choice or decision making out of the 600 and odd. What about those studies? What kind of social stimuli they are talking about? What kind of value stimuli they might be talking about? So these are the text based terms. And they make sense only when you, you know, do it. But a meta-analysis, each meta-analysis, even with the you know, good tools in our hand, will take some significant amount of time. And I don't have the luxury of doing meta-analysis of everything. So I think, and I am very strongly excited that this neurosyn type of a method is the way to go forward. But we might just need to do a lot more to support our findings. That's what I think. So just moving forward, we were just scratching the surface. Uh, I'll just present a little bit more of the type of the work we have been doing. Uh, as I said, this is a hobby type of project, so we've been trying out a lot of things. So one of the things uh, Brain Map Database has done, uh, uh, and in a very decent way, is finding the intrinsic connectivity networks. So they have used uh, independent component analysis along with the metadata descriptions of the studies they have done. All right. And they uh, came up with uh, a very good, beautiful description of the different independent components in the brain, which they call as intrinsic connectivity networks. Uh, so like the resting state connectivity as well as task-based connectivity. So they talk about the intrinsic connectivity networks. So what we have done is we have tried to follow the same pipeline, but using the Neurosyn database, right? And so we take the activation sites, we construct images back, and then we do an ICA, fine, well and good. And then uh, do a clustering, hierarchical clustering on it, right? And apply this uh, bioinformatics method of uh, having a correlogram. So you have uh, clustering on uh, both the key terms. So there were 525 key terms uh, in the version of the database that we have taken and 20 independent components of the brain activation, right? And when you look at this, it's easy to interpret when you have 20 independent components, but when you have 525 text terms not curated by any cognitive term uh, uh, ways, so then it's very difficult to try to make sense of this. So we went ahead and tried to say, is there a good clustering algorithm that can use a text mining approach, simple text mining approach. So we are just trying to look at these frequently occurring words what they mean, is there something that comes together as more logically. So 
I'll present that piece of the work. So what we have done is we have taken uh, the database, we have find the pairwise distances between all the terms, right? Because what we have is the frequency of occurrence in the article. And that's our feature vector. And then we've constructed a graph, a connectivity graph of the words. This is not the brain, right? But these are the words, terms. And uh, each of the terms became a node. And uh, I have a connection between uh, different nodes when, when the distance between them is the shortest. Because I find the distance to every other node, so I draw an edge between two nodes between whom the distance is the sm smallest. And that creates my graph of all the terms. Now in this entire graph, I'm trying to find subgraphs. So one of the interesting, so all to all uh, sort of a connectivity when I try to see, there is one node which is connected to a large number of other nodes, okay? And uh, that term was written. And this is the sentence, written informed consent was obtained from all participants, <laughs> all right? And this is invariably there in all papers, so there's no uh, doubt that it's connected to most of the terms, all right? So things like this, what is my cognitive relevant terms and what are not, right? So we've removed that term and redid it. Uh, so the histogram shows what is how many nodes per cluster. So I'm just trying to find different clusters, right? So what, uh, a better distribution of clusters rather than having, you know, uh, very highly connected one term, right? So I had 248 nodes connected to one term. So other than that, it's better to have a better distribution. So when I removed that term, I got still clusters of the size 75, 94, right? One cluster, but still that's a larger cluster. So what I've gone ahead is, uh, okay, so what, have, what those types of clusters were like, uh, in fact, uh, this uh, method worked beautifully. It found uh, uh, the same stem words, right, which you could also verify with a photostemming algorithm in natural language processing. So persons, person, and self. So there are these terms that my cluster is picking up, right? This is simply text processing. There's no brain connectivity yet involved in here. So motivation, food, and eating becomes uh, a cluster. So just to give you an idea about how those, uh, this method works, right? Then what we did, we went ahead and only took a high frequency. So we did a, just a thresholding on the frequency and only considered those terms, right? So in these, yeah. So in these terms, what happens is um, we, uh, we use the jacquard distance, which ignores if there are zero numbers rather than a Euclidean distance as a distance metric, okay? So what happens is my uh, vectors become smaller and therefore, uh, the nodes that it, they are connected to are more uh, robust. And again, I have uh, good uh, clusters identified. One example of a cluster of size 17 is what you see here, right? Uh, so this is a directed graph because uh, I can be nearest to one neighbor, but uh, the nearest neighbor to that might be different. So just to give an illustration of the visualization of one of those clusters that we found, so what it means is there is a combination of methods that we need and uh, we, we need to use this more often and then we can probably come up with a good understanding of the brain connectivity networks. So that's my last slide. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for hearing. Uh, there would be a way to sort of um, would there be something that journals for example could do that would make such uh, text searches easier if they had is it helpful if they have, well, we have keywords or they do right yeah. so elsevier has all the brain terms and uh, the table uh, tabular coordinates as well as disease terms so they do have uh, I, and even pubmed has started indexing them okay. so this is going in the right direction for sure 
Thank you.